Howdy folks! I uh, haven't shot a video for a while. Uh, I've actually been uh, doing the research for this one and uh, waiting on some information for it. In fact, uh, I attended the uh, Judiciary Committee meeting here in Cody uh, when they had it in October and uh, I needed to get a transcript from the state uh, of the testimony that was given because it was it, it troubled me so I wanted to uh, have a copy of everything that was said line by line so that I could research it and come back with some information <laughs> to uh, combat some of uh, the notions that were going around so uh, I did so wrote the state they sent me uh, an audio copy, sent it postage due, which, I don't know, seems like maybe the state would be able to figure out appropriate postage, but anyway. Got that. Uh, did go line by line through the testimony regarding uh, the impact of marijuana on this state and uh, the felonization of edibles, I guess. Uh, those were two, two topics that were discussed by some experts that were called in by the Judiciary Committee, I assume. I, I guess I don't know who requested the individuals to speak, but uh, it was the WASCOP group, which is the Wyoming Association of Sheriffs and uh, Chiefs of Police, that's what it is. And, uh, you know, they didn't call a single doctor they didn't call a scientist, they didn't call a patient, they didn't call anybody involved with the medical aspects of cannabis. They called an enforcement group whose livelihood is supported by the prohibition that they stand for. And a lobbying group nonetheless. So. That seems like a serious conflict. And in fact, the testimony that was given is, well, it was troubling. So I guess I'll get right into that and hopefully it won't run too long, but <laughs> there's a lot here, so I guess we'll see. Now the first to uh, speak was uh, Shane Johnson, I believe, was his name from uh, Lincoln County. He's a sheriff there. He's also a member of the Wascop group. And uh, the first thing that he said is that people should have a say in marijuana legalization or legislation. And yet, everything that he had to say from this point on was opposing that very thing. Uh, you, you know, we're not, this petition isn't about legalizing cannabis, it's about giving everybody in Wyoming the option to vote yes or no on industrial hemp and medical prescription cannabis. So that's sort of disingenuous. Uh, then he says that, uh, you know, we have to be careful about our sources of information and data. And that's really troubling because their singular source of data on this topic is the HIDA report. That's the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. Now this is a group out of Colorado that is headed by a man named uh, Tom Gorman. And uh, this individual's a drug warrior, uh, spent 30 years as a drug warrior before retiring just so he could head up this Rocky Mountain Haida. Well, okay. Here are some of the issues with the uh, the Haida, okay. Now, uh, Sheriff Johnson, was he was unable to say anything about the Haida authors or their lacking of credentials or the fact that this is not a peer-reviewed study. This is just a propaganda piece that culls information from the sources it chooses in order to get across its political ideology. So, they don't even accurately represent the data that they are supposedly representing. Uh, it, 
The report says that Amendment 64 was uh, only supported by 54% of the people. The number was actually higher than that. The report says that Colorado current voter support for REC is only at 50%, where it's actually 58%. Uh, uh, the report says that there was a 25 uh, times increase in crash risk based on the uh, National Highway uh, Traffic Safety Study. And uh, this is the actual number, if they had actually looked at the data, is zero. It, it's one, uh, well, it's one. It's equivalent to baseline. So. It's a highly selective report that is a perfect example of confirmation bias where they select uh, information that they want to get their idea across out of the total information that does not support their stance. And, I mean, to compile this information, it's important to know how to handle data because you can make numbers look like they say just about anything. So if you take them out of context, if you misapply statistics, then your conclusions don't mean anything. So it's good to have a higher education. It's good to have a scientific degree and a background in handling data scientifically and analyzing data and accurately representing data. And yet when I spoke with Mr. Gorman, he was belligerent. He didn't want to have anything to do with me. He, I, I was, you know, questioning what else he had had published, you know, his credentials, where he was educated. He said, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I've had a fourth grade education or a doctorate. The data is the data. Well, but how you handle the data is determined by how you are educated to handle the data. I mean... There is a reason for things being peer-reviewed. If I just select, you know, n newspaper articles, I can make you think whatever I want if I select just the articles that represent just the opinions that I want you to believe. And that's exactly what the Haida does. And, I mean, the fact that he refused to give me any credentials, uh, any other research papers that he had done, I mean, he was combative, uh, I've never dealt with anyone who was attempting to get off legitimate information, who was combative about their sources, about their education, about their experience. I mean, it just really felt like he had something to hide, he wanted nothing to do with me, and he just had his own agenda. And in fact, uh, he's been criticized publicly for uh, lobbying against cannabis from his position as a non-registered lobbyist who is also a government contractor tasked with informing on the subject. I mean, that's all kinds of conflicts of interests. I, it, it just it blows my mind. And anyway, he stated in an interview that he believes that medical marijuana has legitimate value and that it should be rescheduled, researched, and made available to the needy with compassion for the sick. So... Since our whole petition and everything that we're trying to do now is just about medical legalization, we might as well take that away from the Haida rather than anything else, because if the, the author believes that it should be made available to sick people, hey, that's all we're trying to do. So his propaganda can just go by the wayside. Okay, so let's, let's get back to the judiciary meeting and uh, Officer Johnson. And uh, the next thing he said was that impaired driving has increased because of legalization. Well, actually the NHTSA, which is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, they uh, did a, a really big study on alcohol and drug impaired driving and crash risk. And you know what they found? They found that THC, or the active ingredient in cannabis, does not increase, increase crash risk. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't. That, that's what they found. It, it's, when, you, when you account for demographics and alcohol, the effect of cannabis on driving and crash risk is the same as baseline. So it, it just doesn't increase crash. So apparently impaired 
driving hasn't increased. Now, cannabinoid screening has tripled since 2009 to 2014 in Colorado, so I suspect that as they have experienced legalization and they are testing three times the number of uh, drivers, they're probably finding more people with cannabinoids in their system. But it doesn't mean that impaired driving is taking place. In fact, the uh, annual Colorado DUI and DUID crashes uh, fell between 2011 and 2014. It fell from 546 to 513, which is a 6% drop, and that's also a 2.2% decrease in a total crash percentage in the state. So more people may have cannabinoids in their systems, but crashes are going down. So to say that impaired driving is increased, again, the, the national study as well as the, the Colorado data just doesn't bear that out. Uh, now next he said that uh, youth use has increased. Well, according to a study published in the Journal of Adolescent Health, uh, entitled The Impact of State Medical Marijuana Legislation on Adolescent Marijuana Use. Use risk among youth did not increase in states that passed medical marijuana legislation. So, accounting for uh, all of the states at the time of this study who had passed medical marijuana legislation and pairing them with uh, similar uh, sister states that had not, and comparing the use rates and regressing it and using a scientific analysis to determine the statistical rates that they would expect based on a change in legalization, they didn't find any. So use among youth does not increase when you pass medical marijuana legislation. It just doesn't. Now, uh, the next thing uh, that the officer said is that use has ridden, risen. Well you would expect that. It's a new industry. If people are pleased with it, that's a sign that, you know, it's a good industry, that it's approved by the populace, you know, you're going to expect more people to use it. So I don't, I don't see how that's necessarily a bad thing. But uh, one thing that I would point out is that admitted use has increased. You know, during Prohibition, you're not terribly likely to tell somebody on a poll, oh yes, I do something illegal. Some people will, but I am guaranteeing that there are some who won't. And then now that it's legal, yeah, yes I do, I do. So you're bound to see an increase in numbers, whereas the actual percentage of use may not have changed that same degree. Uh, in fact, uh, Governor Hickenlooper, who was originally against uh, cannabis legalization but has changed his tune, he said that most people who were not smoking marijuana before it was legalized still don't. And that's pretty much what everybody sees. The, the numbers are fairly stagnant. It's not like it's just taking off and, you know, tons of people are using it under uh, recreation. And, you know, again, this is sort of a red herring because we are talking about medical only. And he's saying that the use uh, under uh, recreational laws has increased, and that just doesn't apply to us. But anyway, there hasn't been any new use of epidemic under, or <laughs> any new epidemic of use under uh, recreational legalization. So uh, and Now, he said that ER visits have increased, and again, this is based on the Hyder Report, which is deceptive because ER mentions have increased. Now, that does not indicate that the cause of the visit was because of cannabis. It simply means that at some point during the visit, cannabis was mentioned. The guy can be in there for a broken leg. The doctor says, before I give you this shot of morphine, are you on anything? And he says, well, I smoked a joint last night. That's a marijuana mention. Now, all of a sudden, that is reported as this ER visit having a, a marijuana mention, even though it had nothing to do with the fact that, you know, his leg got run over by a dump truck or something, you know, whatever. So there's a difference between being in the ER because of cannabis and being in the ER and saying, oh, and I'm a cannabis user and I don't want your drugs. You know, that, that's a, those are two different issues. So, it, 
they're not hashed out as to which is which, so you can't simply say that more people are going to the emergency room because of cannabis. And of those who do go to the emergency room because of cannabis, you know what they do? They sit them down in a nice room, they let them be calm, and when they're okay, they leave. Because there's nothing to be done. They're not in physical harm. They're just scared that something is wrong. <laughs> so that's the extent of it. Cannabis just does not damage health. It may cause fear, but it doesn't damage health. And, you know, another issue with the Hyder report, you know, saying that these ER mentions have gone up, it says within the report that its reporting is incomplete prior to 2013. So what's the point? They don't have anything legitimate to tell us. I mean, it's not helpful, so... Next, child exposure has increased. Now... This is fear-mongering. Children have an increased exposure to tasty orange-flavored children's aspirin because it's legal, but that's not a reason to outlaw child's aspirin. And that kills people every year. Just so you know. Cannabis has never killed anybody, ever. But children's aspirin does kill people every year. But that's okay, because the benefits that we see from children's aspirin outweighs the negatives. So it's okay. There is an increased exposure, but we accept that as part of the risk of having that benefit. Now that risk with cannabis doesn't exist in the same way because although children's aspirin may kill your children, if they get into your stash of cannabis, it won't kill them. It has never happened. They may act strange, they may be scared, they may breathe erratically and their heartbeat might get increased, but they're not going to die. They're not going to be physically harmed. If they get into the candy-flavored aspirin, you may find a dead child on the floor. That's a significant difference, and that's not a reason to be fearful of medical marijuana legislation. Now, uh, along the same lines as uh, kids, uh, the uh, the officer was concerned about the the marketing to kids you know because we we see all kinds of uh, n novelty candy bars like keef cats and uh, ganja joys and stuff and of course only kids like candy and of course only kids get the uh, you know the the joke about the uh, the keef cat or the ganja joy i mean who even eats Almond Joys? Do kids even eat Almond Joys? That seems like an old person candy. I don't know. But, but to say that because it comes in an edible form that is sweet and they make jokes about other kinds of candy that it must be marketed to kids? The most candy that I know is consumed by adults. That's all. Now, uh, there's also concern about marijuana cross-border transport, and of course that has increased. This is a desired commodity. There's a percentage of the population in this state that desires to have it both for medicine and for recreation. And when suddenly it's legitimized just a little ways south and just a little ways north, of course there's going to be an influx. People are going to go and get what they desire, and they're going to bring it home. That's not a reason not to legalize. That seems to me like a reason to legalize. It's no longer a problem of ours if we legalize. If they can get it down at the corner store, they're not going to drive to Colorado and bring it back. So... I say legalize. And again... This legislation that we're trying to bring before the people to vote on is not about rec. It's about medical. Let's get away from the fear of cross-border traffic and just legalize, and then it's not a problem. Okay, now, the officer also said that he's not against marijuana, which seems crazy because everything he has said has been against marijuana. He was called there to testify because he's part of a group that is going around the state opposing medical marijuana. So to say that he's not against it, 
does he listen to what he's been saying? I. Again, disingenuous. Everything he said is negative about marijuana. N never said anything about the, the positives, the people who, you know, find some benefit from it. Never says anything about the, the low toxicity or, you know, it just focuses on anything he can come up with, correct or incorrect, that is negative, but then says that he's not against it. I, I don't understand. Now he says that it should be studied for medicine. Well, <laughs> it has been studied for medicine. In fact, it's easy to do a comparison. There is a website called PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, which is a repository for all kinds of medical journal articles. And it, it's public. You can go there and search it. Now, here, here's what I did. You can hop on and search for marijuana. Marijuana on PubMed returns 22,598 results. Man, let me tell you, that is some serious research. That's a lot of research. It has been studied. Now, let's do a different study or uh, search. Search for cannabis uh, yields 14,537 results. THC, that the main um, psychoactive ingredient or the main psychoactive cannabinoid in cannabis, 8,139. Cannabidiol, a non-psychoactive but highly medicinal cannabinoid, 1,435. Now, you can compare this to acetaminophen, which only has 18,970. Omeprazole, which is a Prilosec, which only has 10,845. Or hydrocodone, one that, oh, I took that drug and I hated it. It made me high, I couldn't, I couldn't function, I couldn't drive, I felt terrible, my digestion was wrecked, and it didn't even help that much with the pain. I mean, it was, it was a terrible experience, and I will never take it again. And you know what? It can kill you. It'll shut down your central nervous system. It will wreck you. I mean, it wrecks your liver. It gets you addicted. And if you take too much, you'll die. It's been studied by reference in PubMed, 803 journal articles worth. And yet, marijuana... Just the, the lowest the lowest one on here that I looked, cannabidiol, has more than that at 1,435. THC almost six times that. How can people say it, it needs to be studied or it hasn't been studied? It has been studied. And if you want to take a you know biological study, you can say that for the thousands of years that has been used as medicine and recreation and food as people across various continents on this country or this planet, it has never killed anyone. I don't even know of anybody having an allergic reaction, having a, a damaging health reaction. I don't know of any personally. I've heard of some folks who have schizophrenia having uh, their symptoms worsened, and I would consider that a negative impact, but I don't know of anyone like that. I've only heard of very di divergent individuals having that, so that seems minimized, but anyway, to move on, it has been studied as medicine. And it's ongoing. We're getting more and more and more and more studies done about it being medicine. And you know what? It's good medicine, and that's what they're finding. Okay, so his next statement is that marijuana is treated differently than any other medicine. And uh, for this specifically, he's referring to the one-year prescription. You know, you go and you your doctor says, yes, it, it can benefit you, so I will sign this paper. And that means you get a card, which you can take to your medical marijuana dispensary, and you can buy medical marijuana for the next year. Well, it's treated differently than any other medicine because it is different. It treats such a wide range of maladies, and it does it all 
in a non-toxic, non-threatening sort of way, why should there be restrictions? If there are, I don't see why being slightly less restrictive is a bad thing when you can't cite any harm. But anyway, yes, it is treated differently than other medicines. Other medicines will kill you. Now, he, the next thing he says is that it can't be medicine if it has rec benefits. That is, if, if people are using it for recreation, well, that can't be medicine. Oh, boy. Prescription painkillers, anti-anxiety, antidepressant, stimulants of all kinds, ADHD. Uh, I mean, on and on. There are all kinds of drugs that are abused. Cold medicine is abused. All of those medicines are considered, by med are considered to be medicine by people who are suffering and use them to treat whatever they're suffering from. But they are used by others as recreation. It doesn't mean it's not medicine. So that's just a, it's just a wrong statement. Doesn't sound like medicine is the next thing he says. Well, what sounds like medicine? That doesn't sound like a very educated statement. I mean, in his medical opinion, it doesn't sound like medicine. Oh no, he's a sheriff. Uh, so in his uh, police opinion, it doesn't sound like medicine. What does medicine sound like? I mean, my medicine grows out of the ground and it goes into my body in various forms. If you want to define medicine as being a pill cooked up in a lab, then none of my medicine is sounds like medicine because I have to grind up a flour and brew it in tea to soothe my stomach, or I have to take a piece of a root that's been candied in sugar, and oh no, maybe it's being marketed to kids because it's in sugar, and I mean, what sounds like medicine? Inhalers are medicine, right? So, if I have a little vaporizer pen that I inhale my medicine from, and it treats half a dozen symptoms from as many diseases, why is that not medicine? It sounds to me like he is against it being medicine. But. Next, we go on to the fear of, it's not your parents' marijuana because it's so strong. You know, okay, I have spoken personally with people who have consumed such varieties as Panama Red, Maui Wowie, Thai Sticks, Afghani, Cambodian Sativa. These are things that they had in the 70s. And you know what they've said? They've been down to the dispensaries in Colorado. They've had the highest potency stuff they can get. And they say, ah, this stuff. I wish I had my Panama Red. See, let me explain something to you. I, my education is in the plant sciences, so when you're talking about breeding plants, there is a genetic profile that allows for a physical expression. Now, that is limited. There are limits to what we can produce. Corn is a good example. We've pretty much reached the maximum yield of corn. All the breeding that we can do does not increase corn yields because we've essentially maxed it out. Now, I suspect that's probably what we've also done with cannabis or we're getting really close i mean the percentage of thc is in the high 20s now i mean the the world's most potent cannabis uh ghost train haze came in at i think 28 percent uh at the last at the last get together in spain 27 or 28 percent so i mean it, the most potent thc wise that you can find we are closing in on and I suspect it's not going to get much higher. But the thing is, any time you have had a careful breeder, like say in the back wadis of Afghanistan, or you know the closets of the Northwest, or the jungles of Southeast Asia, if you have people selecting for the traits that they desire for any period of time, it takes a very short period before you are getting those high concentrates that you're looking for. So. To say that it's not our parents' cannabis isn't, isn't exactly correct because those high 
potency strains have been around for essentially all of time. What, what they're referring to was the average. The average potency of cannabis, you know, back pre-80s, was in the single digits, because what you were looking at was you were looking at an agricultural commodity that was coming from Mexican fields. It was treated poorly, baled, you know, bricked, sent across the border, and, you know, sold cheaply. Those exact same strains treated in a horticultural as opposed to agricultural environment will produce much higher percentages, and a little bit of breeding will bring out the max in no time at all. And so what we're seeing now is that those higher quality forms of cannabis are more readily available because more people are growing in a more savvy way. It's not coming across the border from Mexico anymore from the Mexican fields. It's, you know, coming from a warehouse in this country where somebody is using a high-tech hydroponic setup and they're doing a good job of growing high-quality cannabis. And the other thing is, if it's potent, why is that a bad thing? Why is why is extra strength Tylenol worse than regular Tylenol? It's not. Sometimes you need that extra strength Tylenol. Some people need Tylenol 3. They're taking Tylenol and opiates to deal with their pain because they have a higher level of pain that they have to deal with. Same way with THC. Some people want that low grade cannabis, or I mean low grade uh, THC medical variety that's going to help them but not give them uh, psychoactive effects. But then you have other people who aren't even going to notice those psychoactive effects because that THC is going to work in their bodies doing the, everything that's needed and that extra strength, so to speak, is a good thing and needed for those people. So to complain about the high quality or the high concentrate of the cannabinoids in the flowers of today, it, it's backwards. You're, you're consuming less plant material to get the same effect. So it's a good thing to have higher concentrated cannabis. Oh, I sort of got off there. Next. That was a lot here. <laughs> Oh, he says, he says next that, that, that the cannabis of today has been chemically engineered. No, no, no. The chemical engineering comes into play when you're talking about synthetic phonies like Spice and K2 and these other, these other junk drugs that they've sold at gas stations all over the country that have killed people. Yeah, we're talking killed people or, or caused serious psychosis. I mean... There are people suffering because of synthetic cannabinoids that were made because of prohibition that would have never happened if those people simply had access to natural, legal cannabinoids. So no, cannabis is not chemically engineered. It, it, it's hybridized. It's